Hello and welcome to Money, Me and COVID-19, where we meet with leaders from the world of business, finance, investing and politics to understand the full impact of COVID-19 and to learn how we can survive and hopefully thrive coming out the other end of this pandemic. I have another fascinating guest to talk to today. He spent a career in banking and accountancy before moving into politics, where for 13 years he was a Conservative Member of Parliament, serving in Margaret Thatcher's government. He then moved across to the Liberal Democrats in 2001 and was made a life peer five years later. Perhaps most relevant to us, he's become best known as one of the country's most successful investors and became our first ISA millionaire back in 2003. He's written two books, How to Become sorry, how to make a million slowly, and also a book aimed at teenagers, Yummy Yogurt, A First Taste of Stock Market Investing. He's a regular contributor to the Financial Times, and his focus is very much on small and mid-cap stocks. His full title is Lord Lee of Trafford, but I'm on first name terms. So John, welcome to Money and Me. Thank you, Graham. Good morning. And now, John, you've got the benefit of almost six decades of investment experience to put this into context. So how would you compare the COVID-19 crisis with some of the other things that you've seen come and go over the years? Well, it's pro it was probably the most unexpected uh, and uncertain uh, crisis that I've been through, but by no means the worst. My, my mind goes back to the secondary banking crisis in the 1970s when stocks fell to a level where no one was buying. Uh, if you recall, London and County Bank crash, Northern Developments, House Builder crash, Ronald Lyle Estates crash, and there was rumors about the NatWest. Uh, and no one would buy, and blue chips, so-called blue chips, um, were yielding 20% plus. Uh, so it was an extraordinary period where the stock market really plummeted. Uh, and so, what that taught me um, relatively early in my investment life was that events can come along that are totally unexpected, like the pandemic, and therefore one must never, never invest borrowed money, uh, never be pressured by the, the bank. One must only invest money that you actually can lock away for the longer term. Okay, but we've also seen, as well as the, the, the scale of this pandemic, we've seen unprecedented measures taken by governments around the world, effectively closing down economies. Um, what impact has, have you seen that have on the kind of companies that you have in your portfolio? Well, fortunately, um, the majority of companies uh, that I'm focused on and that are big holdings for me, the majority um, have actually traded reasonably well uh, throughout the uh, uh, the pandemic uh, and my sort of five or six real core holdings uh, like um, Anpario, Concurrent Technologies, uh, Lock and Store, uh, Treat, um, they, they've traded pretty well in the circumstances uh, and actually paid increased dividends during this period. Um, so I've been relatively fortunate, um, but uh, I have um, uh, suffered because uh, I'd, I'd parked, to use that word, uh, a certain amount of money that came from uh, last year's takeovers uh, in, in things like Aviva and Legal and General. Uh, and, um, you know, they, they suffered quite a lot. So that wasn't a very clever period for me. But fortunately, I haven't really been invested in, in the, the sectors that have been most affected. Uh, like uh, restaurants and, uh, uh, and airlines. Well, what, one thing your career has been a great advertisement for, I suppose, are, are two core parts of an investment strategy. One is buy and hold, and the other is making use of tax wrappers. So um, I'm sure you won't be uh, too embarrassed if I share the, the phenomenal results you've had, where I think you've put something like 126,000 in from the first days of personal equity plans through to ISAs. And then that has grown to probably north of four million pounds now in, in an entirely tax-free wrapper. So, um, you know, that, that, that just shows, I guess, the, the, the benefits of a combination of buy and hold, don't overtrade, and put them into the right kind of wrapper. And, and you know, for most people, I would imagine that's just a, 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 a phenomenal result. Yeah. So, so what, what's been the secret of how you've got there, John? Well, the secret really has been, insofar as there's a secret, um, uh, reinvesting dividends 
uh, and taking the long view and staying with uh, businesses that one has invested in. Now, obviously, you know, I've made mistakes. We all make mistakes. But by and large, you know, I've stayed with a lot of the companies that I invested in for, for many years, 10, 15 years, uh, and have seen the benefit of that. Uh, and that is really a strong message to, to investors. Uh, and that is really to, to, to try and get invested into, into good, genuine businesses and stay with them. The, the biggest problem that most investors have, from my experience, is the chopping and changing. Uh, and they see a short-term profit and they feel they must take it or, or they chase the, you know, the latest hot tip. Uh, and, um, you know, that really isn't the, the way to do it. And of course, one of the problems is that the development of technology, which gives instant access to, to prices and one's portfolio, um, you know, almost on a minute by minute basis, does lend itself to um, a rather short term trading operation. Uh, and therefore, you know, one's got to be quite disciplined to, to stay the course. But I'm quite convinced that the way to, to you know, build uh, a really valuable portfolio over the years is to get into good companies, uh, avoid the losses, avoid the losses if one can, uh, and stay with those investments. Okay, well, I want to come back to more about your investment strategy in a moment but let's just stay on the, on the subject of tax wrappers because broadly investors in the UK face a choice between two main options one is the kind of SIP pension plan um, where you get tax relief on the way in but you're taxed on what you take out and the other is the ISA where you get no tax relief on the way in but there's no tax on the way out so I mean how would you compare the two you've obviously gone mainly down the ISA route but for, for people watching us perhaps trying to weigh up that choice how, how would you compare say a SIP to an ISA? Well I'm not I'm not an expert I'm not an expert on on uh, SIPs at all so I can't um uh, or pensions uh, you know I, I, I've only gone the the the, the uh, PEP ISA route and all I would say in, in now is that the ISA is probably the most attractive wrapper uh, in the in the Western world, and, and many foreign investors, are, I can assure you, are very jealous uh, of the of the uh, tax free advantages that, that that come with that. To be free of income tax uh, and capital gains tax, uh, an inheritance tax if you invested in AIM stocks that do qualify, and now also relatively recently the ability to transfer um, tax the taxation benefits of ISA to one's spouse on death or vice versa. I mean, th this is an incredible combination and, and a better combination that we had um, when I started in investing in PEPs, I think in the, in the 1980s when they, first, uh, uh, when they first came in. But, but that, the whole basis of my investment approach is really to, to endeavor to build a portfolio brick by brick. Uh, and that really is what I've tried to do. And obviously the, the ISA has had a tremendous advantages uh, and I do hope um, fingers crossed that that continues and, uh, and no chancellor interferes with that. Yeah because unfortunately uh, uh, it seems that politicians and chancellors can't resist interfering with things where, where um, there's significant amounts of money involved and of course now we have this what I personally feel is a ridiculous concept of a lifetime limit so that for example if, if, if you had chosen to go down the SIP route you'd be paying 55% tax on your outperformance, as it were, uh, above and beyond that lifetime limit. Whereas so far, thankfully, there's been no, not that much interference with, with ISA. So um, do you think going forward that uh, uh, you know, there's a risk that ISAs could become the, the subject of a, of a chancellor's focus in the same way as Mr. Osborne got involved with pensions? I think there's, there's, always, there's always a risk. But I think it would be very, very difficult for the government to bring in, and very wrong for the government to bring in, in anything that was retrospective. Um, uh, and therefore, you know, I, I'm hoping and expecting that uh, one, one uh, chancellor doesn't touch the existing situation. Um, obviously, in the future, uh, they may well vary the amounts that, uh, that one can put in. And at some stage, they may say, if you have a certain amount invested in, a, in an ISA, uh, you can't put any more in, uh, but, but those are um, uh, possibilities for the future. I think the biggest risk, uh, and it's a it, it's a risk that that uh, that I have because obviously quite a number of my investments are AIM stocks. The biggest risk is is I think to the uh, the tax relief that goes with um, 
uh, in companies. And if that were to be taken away, um, that would, uh, I'm sure, uh, give quite a knock to a lot of shares that are quoted on AIM. Uh, and I have quite a number of them. So that would be quite a big negative. So let's hope he doesn't touch that. OK, well, I, th I think clearly that the, the foundation of your success and you use the term brick by brick as, 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 as an appropriate uh, 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 description of that strategy is choosing the right company. So what, what are the criteria that you use to select the company and, and where do you go to look for the information to support your analysis? Well, if, if we take the criteria first, um, uh, basically by applying uh, common sense. Um, uh, and therefore, uh, I, I, first of all, I, I don't um, get involved or invest in startups or biotech stocks or, or exploration stocks. Um, now, I, I entirely accept that there are people who've done very, very well by investing in those sectors, but they are specialist sectors. Uh, best left to 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 those who, who focus on them. Uh, I mean, I'm rather more of a generalist in a way. So I, I ideally want to come in to a business um, that is already established and quoted, obviously, um, that uh, is paying dividends, uh, where um, the comments, the last comments from the company are fairly optimistic, uh, particularly where the people the key people running the business have significant stakes in that business. Uh, companies also um, that, that have uh, a certain amount of liquidity, um, cash in the, in the balance sheet, and are not overborrowed. Uh, and ideally, uh, companies that are uh, based in the UK and have, have operations in the UK, but do trade on a global basis, because I don't invest overseas. So the majority of my small caps are, are really mini global businesses. And, and the whole key about them is that, that I am coming in when they're already established and hopefully paying dividends uh, and we have established brands and, and uh, a market position. Uh, and so one is minimizing the risk on the downside because the, the key to successful investment is to avoid the losses because we will all have uh, successes and get things right. But um, if you have uh, negatives on the other side of the balance sheet, um, then your losses can easily uh, uh, cancel out many of your or most of your profits. So um, mine is essentially a conservative approach uh, designed to avoid losses where possible uh, and to invest in good, solid, genuine businesses uh, that are fairly carefully stewarded. And that's why I, I like family businesses. Uh, and um, uh, I do apply, um, you know, fair time scale to them. Now, um, yes, of course, I've made losses. Uh, yes, of course, I've mistakes. Yes, I've changed investments over the years many times. Sometimes I think that I've probably owned at one stage almost all the quoted shares in, uh, uh, you know, on, on the stock market. Um, but um, uh, you, you obviously over the years, six years, having invest, been invested for sixty odd years. One hopes one's learnt something, as it were, and I try to pass on um, the 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 pluses and the benefits that that, that I've learnt uh, and and honed within my own portfolio over the years uh, to others. Okay, so so uh, I mean we live in this information age now with all sorts of things available on the internet, but also you know, good old annual reports and so on. So. So what is it that, you know, what are the information sources you go to to try and validate your, your hunch that you might have found a good company worth investing in? Well, um, in, in terms of, uh, in terms of where, where I look, where I get my ideas from, I suppose it would be fair to say that I'm pretty well aware of all, all quoted companies on the, on the main market, as it were, having obviously built up a you know, a fair, a fair um, knowledge of them over the years. But of course, there are a whole number of, of newer AIM companies um, where, where it's almost impossible to, um, uh, to keep up. Uh, and I, you know, I've got friends in the investment community who will own, you know, maybe a couple of hundred different companies because it enables them to actually, um, you know, be aware of a lot of these younger growing companies. And then they'd obviously try and focus on some that they believe to be better than others. Whereas I've tended to stick with 
um, the ones that I've invested in and like. Uh, and if I do have uh, extra funds coming in from savings or from dividends that I reinvest, I prefer to build up the, the holdings um, that I've got into significant holdings. So I don't believe in, a, in an overspread and an over diversified portfolio. The other thing that we haven't mentioned, uh, Graham, is of course that I've been on the receiving end uh, because I'm an investor predominantly in small cap stocks, as you said, uh, in takeover bids. So I've probably been on the receiving end uh, within my ISA uh, and outside my ISA of probably over 50 uh, takeovers over the years. Most of them, of course, um, you know, bringing a premium to a, a prevailing stock market price. Okay, well, that's an interesting topic you bring up there because I, I, I recently uh, interviewed uh, Dr. Mark Mobius, who's uh, a similarly active investor, but not more in the uh, emerging and frontier markets. And he's a great advocate for investor activism. And he said, look, you know, when you are a shareholder, you own a piece of this company. So why not turn up at the AGM? Why not you know, get involved? What, what's your kind of approach to the level of, of activism that you take in your portfolio? So I'm, a very, I'm, a, I'm very active um, in, in, in terms of relationship. Uh, uh, you know, in the old days, I used to go and um, you know, attend a lot of AGMs. Uh, I don't need to do that now. I don't do that. Um, but I do tend to try and keep pretty close to the, the chief executives and similar uh, of the, the businesses where I have significant investments. Uh, and I talk to them uh, and I meet them from time to time. And um, uh, some come and see me now at, uh, uh, you know, at, at, in the House of Lords at Westminster and come in and have a coffee or a drink or a, a meal. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm not looking for inside information for you know fairly obvious reasons that's that's wrong but what i am looking to do is to is to make sure that the the the, the people that i back the, those who are running the business that i invest in you know are genuine have a have a long-term strategy uh and um uh, are people that i feel comfortable to essentially invest my savings with um and some of them for example you know we have a a uh, little bit of a fun from time to time. So Treat, for example, in a company in Flavors and Fragrances, which is my largest holding, uh, they normally come and see me on their results day when they're touring the, the city uh, city institutions, and they normally come and have a cup of tea uh, with me in the House of Lords about quarter past four. Uh, and and um, uh, the, 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 the joke is that, that if the dividend isn't increased by more than 5%, then they don't get a slice of fruitcake with their tea, basically. So there is a little bit of an incentive for them. Wow, yes, that's, that's pretty serious stuff. But I mean, a core part of your success has been this reinvestment of dividends. Now, a lot of companies have taken, I think, rather advantage of COVID-19 to really cut back their dividends and possibly reset them for the long term. So if, if somebody was starting out now copying your strategy, do you think it's perhaps going to take them a bit longer to achieve the same success because of that? Uh, yes, uh, in terms of in terms of dividend receipts, uh, you know, I'm glad you make the point that you do because I I feel that uh, and I uh, criticise a number of companies for, in a sense, taking advantage uh, of the pandemic to actually defer uh, or cancel dividends. Now, you know, I I entirely accept and support companies. That, that really you know, risk going under, as it were, and so to survive, they needed to to um, husband all the resources and, and postpone or cancel dividends. I have no problem with that at all. But there were a number of others who were quite cash rich and could well have paid or at least paid half their dividends. Um, you know, who didn't and, and and took advantage. Now, when those dividends come back, uh, I think that they will be rebased. Uh, and they will be at, at a lower level, which is what you're hinting at. Uh, because I think there's a generalization. Probably British companies have paid out rather too much by way of dividend, and the dividend cover has tended to, to slide. So I think we're talking about a, a lower generation of dividends, dividend, uh, dividends in the future. Um, having said that, I think dividends will return. Uh, and they will be uh, they will be useful. I think one of the, the uh, in a sense uh, an argument uh, 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 the other way is that these days because there are so many investors 
um, using the web and researching companies and, and so many big investment funds. Um, some of those smaller cap stocks uh, are now much better researched than they were in my earlier days, and therefore their quality can be recognized somewhat earlier. Um, so th there is a certain balance there. But uh, your point on dividends is well made. It's not going to be such a, a, such a bountiful period ahead. I, I think that would be a fair comment. And, and the other thing I think sets your strategy apart from, from most people that, that, that I meet is, is this very much based on individual companies, whereas most people tend to go for uh, funds of one sort or another, unit trusts, investment trusts, and so on. There we have this great debate between actively managed funds and passive managed funds. Now, passive has had a good sort of decade as it's followed a, a, a long bull market on the way up. But I wonder perhaps, uh, could the 2020s see a turning point where this becomes more the decade of the, of the selective stock picker, do you think? Well, I hope it is. Um, I mean, I, I've, I've had a huge amount of pleasure uh, from investing in individual companies and building up the relationship with them. Uh, I may well have done better had I invested in 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 one or two funds. Um, you know, who, who knows? But uh, you know, I've enjoyed the way I've done it, uh, and uh, I've never been happy to to pay fees for others to manage my funds. Uh, and I think a lot of people, frankly, could do as well, at least as well as many of the fund managers do, uh, if they invested their own resources and handled. Uh, their share buying and their share dealing themselves. And, and what I've tried to do uh, is, in a sense, to almost become an evangelist um, through articles that I've written and through this sort of interview and through the books that I've written to try and encourage people to, to really um, take their own decisions and back their own judgment. You know, it, it's, it's not rocket science. It really is much more common sense. And most people are capable, in my view, of delivering at least uh, as good a return as most fund managers have achieved in recent years, uh, and you're not paying the fees. Okay, but, you know the, the, the glib advice we often hear, of course, is to buy low and sell high. I mean, uh, when you're looking at a company, you know what makes you think, well, that that's the kind of a fair or you know a cheap share price to buy at, and is there a point at which you say, well, actually, it's become such a high share price now that I, I think it's time to sell? What, what's your kind of you know? buy and sell criteria to make sure you're not overpaying or you're perhaps reached a point where it's time to take profits? Well, I think this has changed over the years. I, I remember years ago writing an article saying that one should, should, should look for shares offering a double seven, in other words, a P ratio of seven and a yield of seven. Um, then as prices rose, that became rather unrealistic. But, but the key has always been to, to get in at the right sort of level. And therefore, um, I've never wanted to chase companies uh, paying fees of, you know, 30 plus, as it were. Uh, and I'm afraid I've totally missed out uh, on, uh, you know, some of those great American uh, tech stories, the, the stories of the fangs, because of the, um, the way I missed out early on. And then they've gone to, to valuations that really... Um, uh, I'm just not happy with at all. And of course, the problem with investing in, in the, some of those uh, stocks with a very high P ratio is it's, it's what I call investing on the high wire. If something goes wrong, there's a long way to fall. Um, and I'm much more of a, I hope this has come through in, this, in our discussion, that I'm, I'm really much more of a conservative, cautious investor um, trying, to in, trying to avoid the, the losses Okay, so, so, so John, one of, the, one of the pieces of glib advice we often hear is to buy low and sell high. What, what makes you decide whether a share price is, is low enough to, to come into your portfolio or it's become so high that you think it's time to sell? Well, I, th I think over the years, you know, my, my view has changed. I remember years ago writing an article uh, advocating that investors should focus on what I term a double seven which was a seven price earnings ratio and a seven dividend yield. Uh, well, those days, have broad brush have sadly gone. Um, and one is talking about much higher valuations now. Um, but I've never enjoyed uh, investing uh, on high PE ratios. Um, it, it's what I term investing on the high wire. If something goes wrong, you know, there's a long way to fall. So I'm looking to, to get in now probably 
um, ideally not paying much more than a price earnings ratio just into double figures uh, and, a po and a positive dividend yield uh, ideally of probably you know three and a half four percent upwards uh, so essentially once again it's a fairly conservative approach to to investing okay now uh, obviously most of what we talked about has been in the, the realm of uh, stocks and shares have you ever been tempted into that other british obsession of uh, buy to let property investing never no i i've i i'm totally focused on the the stock market which has been you know a major interest and a hobby over the years uh on on uk stocks primarily on uk small caps um and and never really uh, I've never really wondered. So, um, uh, you know, for me, the stock market has been a huge part of my life, uh, and thankfully, uh, in recent years, it's given me a degree of financial independence, which I appreciate. Okay, well, one of my personal uh, hobby horses, especially since we moved from uh, defined contribution, sorry, defined benefit to defined contribution pensions, we've all effectively had to become our own fund managers, and yet there's remarkably little financial education for us. And I suspect that was partly the driver behind the book you wrote uh, aimed at younger people, the, the Yummy Yogurt book. Just tell me a bit about what drove you to write that and, and what's the kind of material that the book actually covers. Well, I, I've, al I've always believed that, that young people, uh, sadly in our country, um, received near, near zero uh, advice on, on finance and investment and budgeting. And I think it's a great tragedy so they move into the world of um, uh, university and then careers really with very little background and knowledge uh, so i've tried uh, obviously over the years to uh, with my own daughters for example to to uh, interest them in the stock market i built up portfolios for them and i remember on one occasion um rather rather proudly phoning my daughter who was probably about nine or ten at that stage uh, telling her that I'd just been in touch with a stockbroker and her portfolio was now worth X, uh, hoping that she'd be really pleased. And, and her reply was, you know, well, thanks, Dad. Keep it up. I'm just watching a video at the moment, but well done. Keep it up, you know. So uh, I, I've not really succeeded with my, uh, with my two daughters, but maybe my grandchildren might, um, might do better. Um, but uh, rather, rather more seriously, um, not only did I realize that there was so little teaching in schools, but there seemed also to me to be, um, you know, hardly any book or similar that young people could actually read um, that would give them the basics uh, of the stock market uh, and take away that fear just to give them the basic principles. So a couple of years ago, I resolved to, to, to write a book, what, the, my second book that you mentioned, um, called Yummy Yogurt, A First Taste of Stock Market Investment. Which, it, which is, it, it's a very small, easy to short, easy to read book, only about 35 pages. Uh, and and it's, it's told through the story of a, um, and this is why it's called Yummy Yogurt, uh, of a Devon farming family, uh, who, who, where the wife starts a little yogurt manufacturing business to supplement the farm income. And that grows, uh, and then they, they build a purpose-built factory, business uh, prospers, uh, and then, uh, it goes public, uh, and then there's a family in Berry with teen Berry Lancashire with teenage children, and they have a certain amount of inheritance money to invest. They don't know what to do with it. Their parents encourage them to think about the stock market, and at that stage, Yummy goes public, uh, and they know Yummy and enjoy Yummy yogurt products. So they invest some of their money in that, uh, and they they get those shares, uh, and the the business grows further, and then ultimately. It's, it's taken over so it's told through a, a short story a short easy to read story um, and there are glossaries of terms as well uh, and um, I try to put it across some basic points some of the points that you know we've talked about earlier on in our interview today uh, and um, it, it, it's it's a, an easy read uh, and a short read uh, and no one has criticized me for that I'm, I'm glad to say um, because it, it was very very deliberate uh, I knew that if I produced a tome you know, of 200, 300 pages, youngsters uh, just wouldn't read, wouldn't dip in, and the book would be left on the shelf. So this is, I, this, my idea behind it um, was to, to write what I think is probably the first book 
focused on teenagers or novices. And, and I think and hope, and it's proved to be a, you know, quite an attractive present, um, bought not by the young people themselves, but really bought more by parents and godparents and grandparents uh, as a present to try and encourage young people to at least um, get the basics of the of what investment is about uh, and then if they want to read further if they want to take it more seriously um, then obviously there, there are far more books that they can choose from but this is very much a uh, to, to use a very old a very old school word a primer really um, uh, and um, you know I'm glad to say it's been quite well reviewed no, I mean, uh, all, all power to you for that, because I, I think, you know, the, the more we can do to get these ideas out there, the better. And of course, you know, if they were to start with a, a junior ISA, you know, the miracle of compounding for them would mean that they could be multimillionaires by the time they're in their 40s or 50s. I would I would hope some of them would would end up at would would end up. Um... Uh, as as um, uh, individuals, you know, with substantial portfolios, and interesting enough, when I've gone around to one or two schools to talk to the the sixth form, uh, you know, about the book and about my investment life, um, what for the first time, one or two uh, have actually said, um, well, you know, th this is an interesting world. I haven't really considered this as a career, uh, and um, some of them uh, have have uh, I think. Um, genuine ideas to really uh, ultimately move into careers associated with uh, with investment or, or, or banking. Fantastic. Uh, just just coming back to, to yourself uh, uh, for a little while, John, what, just out of interest, what was it that made you decide to make the switch across the House from the Conservatives to the Liberal Democrats? Well, I was, I was a Conservative MP for 13 years, from 79 to 92, and I lost my seat in 92. Uh, uh, and then for a few years, I wasn't really involved in politics at all. I had a range of involvements in Manchester, some of them in the public sector. Um, uh, and uh, then the, I'm still nominally a member of the Tory party, um, but then uh, in, in the, the era of uh, Ian Duncan Smith and Michael Howard, uh, the, the Tory party, Conservative party moved in my view, um, very much to the right. Uh, and also became increasingly anti-European, uh, neither of which were my positions. So um, I said to myself, you know, look, um, really, uh, does this party now represent, uh, you know, what the, the things that I believe in? Uh, I decided it didn't, so I resigned from it. Uh, and then a few years later, uh, I joined the, the Liberal Democrats, whose, whose broad attitudes um, were much closer to mine. And uh, then Charles Kennedy, when he was the Lib Dem leader, uh, offered me a Lib Dem peerage in 2005. So I've been fortunate in having 13 years in the Commons, six ministerial years there, and then 13 years in the, in the Lords. Okay, and of course, I guess, you know, I can probably gather from that what your views would have been on Brexit, but, you know, we are where we are, and it's actually, and ironically, COVID-19 has taken it off the agenda for, for a little while. Um, it looks to me increasingly like, because the clock's still ticking, uh, do you think we're heading towards no deal? And if so, what do you think the likely impact of that's going to be? I, it, it's, very, it's very difficult to know. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not a betting man, but I, my hunch is, that at the end of the day there will be some sort of some sort of agreement. I, I would have thought that maybe 60, 40, something like uh, something like that. But you know, to me, um, you know, without wishing to be over political and, and uh, getting involved in the in the argument again, you know, what the pandemic has shown is is, is you know that we are uh, in a global community, a global society. The the the, the virus started abroad. It spread rapidly through other countries, uh, and and you know this idea that that um, uh, any country like Britain can can really almost put up uh, sort of nationalist barriers around it, uh, it, it you know to me it, it it's it's it, it's totally outdated, um, uh, and uh, I, I just think it's a it's a negative retrograde step. Um, virt virtually all the senior business leaders, not everyone, but virtually all senior business leaders and those involved in, in, in manufacturing businesses and, and the world of finance, the majority, not everyone, 
um, you know, really recognizes that. Uh, and uh, I think if we'd had a, if we have a, another vote, uh, I think the result may well be the other way. I think it's a, it's a pity it went the way it did, um, but we are where we are now, so uh, we will make the best of it. And I have to say, talking to the chief executive of the companies that I'm invested in, um, you know, I don't think, hopefully, those companies are going to suffer too much. Okay, great. Well, as we come to the end of our time together, uh, John, I'd just like to pick your brains really on what would be the kind of nuggets of investment advice you would offer to those people watching us based on the, the success you've enjoyed over the years? If there's just two or three things that they need to focus on, what would those be? It, it, it would be, first of all, keeping some money back from the stock market. Um, uh, what I term heart bypass money, the family emergencies, um, you know, you mustn't invest all your money on the stock market. You must never borrow uh, and um, be, be an investor rather than a, a trader. Uh, an investor is someone who, who buys a share in a company, um, owns a portion of that company and stays with it and hopefully lets it grow and develop. Uh, uh, someone who treats the stock market like, a, uh, like the casino uh, is hopping in and out all the time. Uh, I, I doubt, unless they're very lucky, whether they will actually um, do anything like as well as those who, who, who sit there and, um, uh, uh, and are patient. Uh, it, the stock market's given me a huge amount of, uh, of interest and, and fun and involvement over the years. Thankfully, by and large, it, it, it's worked out. I could have done better. Um, but at least it's, you know, I can put bread on the table. <laughs> I'm sure you can. Lord Lee of Trafford, thanks very much for joining us and thanks for sharing your advice with us today. Thank you, Graham. Thank you.